Today we're going to continue our discussion of deep learning, but we're going to take a more general approach. We're going to look at the frameworks that you can use to try to do deep learning efficiently and effectively. So first, let's start talking about how computational linguistics can fit together with deep learning. So when we talked about deep learning before, it was always in terms of continuous entities. We had vectors that represented our input, we had matrices and continuous functions applied to those matrices, and all of this was expressed in terms of continuous numbers and continuous functions. But in language, everything's discrete. Words are discrete. There's no such thing as 1.5 times root of vega or the average between tree and Bartholomew. Words are discrete. And even once you get beyond words, if you have parse trees or other structures, those graphs and trees are themselves discrete objects. And so you need to have some way to move between the discrete world of computational linguistics and the continuous world of deep learning. So that makes our challenge a little bit more difficult. And, and this is why natural language processing is relatively late to the game compared to something like computer vision, where they had continuous inputs and continuous functions from the very beginning. We're a little bit later and slower because all of our inputs are discrete. So one question you may be asking is why not just do it yourself? Why mess around with these frameworks? So first of all, it's hard to compare with other people. Uh, so uh, this is sort of the peer pressure argument. Everybody else is doing it, you should be doing it too. And because science doesn't happen in a vacuum, this is actually a compelling argument. Everyone else is using frameworks, so if you want to compare against other people's code, you need to know how these frameworks work yourself. A common problem in machine learning is the difference between model and optimization. Often a result in machine learning is the product of a combination of some model plus an optimization algorithm. So how do you separate the two? Often it's very difficult. And if you use a framework, one of the nice advantages is that it becomes very easy to swap out various optimization frameworks for any particular model. Debugging is always difficult, and I'm not going to try to tell you that frameworks make debugging any easier, but it makes debugging different. So if you write your own optimization and model code from scratch, you will have very unique problems and very unique debugging challenges. You will still have challenges if you use these frameworks, but at least your problems won't be as unique. Oftentimes the problems will be very similar to the problems that people have had in the past, and so it's easier to learn from other people's mistakes. This doesn't necessarily make these bugs less frustrating because you'll have to deal with a much larger code base and maybe you won't even be able to fix it yourself. You'll need to be able to explain what the problem is to someone at Facebook to get them to fix the problem, but at least you'll be working with other people. So this isn't a strong argument, but it makes it less of a solitary experience. And finally, if you build everything yourself, it's very hard to tweak the model. So you have this great model, or you borrow a model from somebody else you download off the web, and you have an idea for how to change it slightly, add a new parameter here, or uh, change the optimization based on the model specification. That's very hard to do if you've written everything from the ground up. The inference and the model are very tightly intertwined. But if you use these frameworks, it's very easy to extend and to tweak these models. And many people argue that this has sped up science. A contrarian opinion would be that this has led to a lot of incremental papers that just make tiny tweaks and don't necessarily advance our understanding of the world. But in any event, uh, these frameworks let you do those tweaks more easily. Our goals for today Hopefully, by the end of today, you'll understand what PyTorch is, a very specific framework that we'll be talking about more in this class. You'll also be able to understand the basic foundation of these 
deep learning frameworks, the computation graph. And from that, we'll then be able to work on a full example of how to use these frameworks and computation graphs to solve deep learning problems specifically for language. So let's see what computation graphs are. So a computation graph is built out of variables. So let's say that we have some vector x. That is itself a computation graph, but a very trivial one. It's just sitting off by itself. You have a node that represents a piece of data, some expression. And it is very easy to evaluate. The vector x is the vector x. But let's say that you want to do something to that vector. Let's say that you want to take the transpose of it. So now our computation graph has become a little bit more complex. We have taken our single node and we have drawn an edge from that node to some other node. So this node here now represents some computation. This represents taking the transpose of the original vector. So these nodes represent some expression, and the edges represent the operation that you're applying to that expression. One thing that's very important is that these edges don't just have the function, but it also keeps track of what is the derivative of the function with respect to all of the relevant variables. And so in this case, what is the derivative of the function with respect to the underlying vector? Okay, this is a very simple expression. Let's make it a little bit more complex. Let's add in another variable. So now we're going to take the transpose of the vector x and multiply it by a matrix A. So now we have a more complicated computation graph. And here we have taken a single vector and we're going to multiply it by a matrix. So now we're getting into nodes that have two incoming edges. And those two incoming edges represent different inputs to a function. And just as we had to keep track of the gradient with respect to a single variable, now each of these edges have to keep track of the gradient with respect to different variables. We can also reuse expressions in these computation graphs. So we can have x transpose a x, and so that x gets reused twice in the computation graph. And now our tree becomes a directed asymptotic graph. Okay, why are we talking about functions and gradients? This is horribly complicated. Why can't, uh, this is horribly complicated. Why are we doing this? So recall, that in deep learning, the big tool that we're going to use is backprop. So you have some expression, it computes an answer. We're going to represent these expressions as computation graphs. And once we have the output of those computation graphs, we're going to see what the answer should have been. That gives us a loss. We now have a signal that we can use backpropagation to propagate through the rest of the computation graph to update the parameters so we can improve our algorithm. The computation graph gives us a general way of creating expressions. If we also encode in these computation graphs the derivatives with respect to each of the individual operations, once we're done, we can use the chain rule to multiply all of the edges together to create a full gradient of the desired loss function with respect to each of the underlying parameters. And this allows us to very quickly derive automatically the backpropagation that we talked about before. And so if we need to compute the gradient with respect to any parameter, we can just go through the computation graph and multiply the individual partial derivatives by each other. As our functions become more complex, the Computation graphs get larger, but the underlying idea remains the same. We have some expression, say y, that is the result of a computation graph. We can label the nodes with expressions that correspond to something in our model. We can label nodes in the computation graph that correspond 
to properties that we want to minimize. So for example, we may want to minimize the loss of y with respect to some true label that we're applying to our data. And this is the basic idea of using these frameworks. There are three big steps. So first, you construct the graph. You build up the expressions that encode your model. Then, your algorithm needs to be able to take inputs, go up the computation graph, as we showed it on the previous screen, and produce outputs. Once you have those outputs, you compare them to a reference that you want to optimize. That gives you a loss. That loss then needs to backpropagate through the computation graph to give you a gradient with respect to each of the variables that you're going to optimize. As you go on the forward pass, you need to respect the topological sort of the data. And that's just a fancy way of saying that you need to fill in the nodes after all of the things leading into it have been filled in. So your current parameters are known, so you know what x is, and a and b and c. And so from that, you can start filling in the internal nodes of this graph. You could do either of these two nodes. Doesn't matter which order you do them in. They're both perfectly valid first steps. Let's say that you compute the transpose first. Then you could either do the matrix multiplication or the vector product. Let's say you do the matrix multiplication first. Then you now have two choices that you can do. Now let's say that you multiply b times your vector x. Then you can now do the matrix multiplication again and finally sum everything together. So you fill in the forward pass obeying the topological sort of the data. So just about any framework that you use will use this sort of computation graph to create these expressions and use automatic differentiation to figure out the overall gradients. So nothing is specific to any framework thus far in our conversation. But where it's different is how do you construct these graphs? So let me just say that this is constantly changing, and so uh, things may have changed by the time that you hear this compared to when I created the slide. But one big difference in how these frameworks think about data is are these graphs static or dynamic? So we're going to focus on dynamic constructed graphs, so things like PyTorch, Dynet, Chainer, this allows you to have more flexibility, and it encodes a lot of the properties that we see in language. We'll talk about that more in a second. The downside is that these frameworks tend to be a little bit slower. That's a price that you're going to pay for the flexibility that you get from these models. As I said, we're going to be focusing on PyTorch. PyTorch is a relatively popular framework that does dynamic computation. And why is dynamic graph construction useful for natural language processing. Hierarchy exists everywhere in language. And so when you construct a word, you have characters. Those characters form stems, suffixes, and prefixes. Those words form phrases together. And those phrases form sentences. Those sentences create documents. Those documents create chapters, and those chapters create books, and those books create libraries. And so you have hierarchy all the way down. And often, your models want to be able to incorporate that hierarchy. But this hierarchy is not fixed. You're not always looking at 32 by 32 pixel images. There can be any number of words in a sentence. Those words can have any number of letters. You can have many, many prefixes in a single word. So the graphs that you're using for the computations can vary dramatically. As a result, we want to have frameworks that allow us to have dynamic graph construction. And while there are several frameworks that allow us to do that, we'll be focusing on PyTorch. PyTorch grew out of a Lua framework for deep learning. It then transitioned into Python. In both cases, they're using a very, very fast C backend. And PyTorch is now an open source project. There are many developers, but the central effort is concentrated at Facebook AI research. So there's good industry support and it's relatively fast. One of the most important things that frameworks allow you to do is to offload computation from the CPU 
which is what gets used if you write a generic program in Python to the GPU. So if you look inside a computer, the CPU uh, is often the thing under a big fan, and the GPUs are discrete cards that you plug into the computer. And graphics processors were designed for computer gamers who wanted to render things quickly. And those rendering operations look a lot like matrix multiplications, and that is the heart of most deep learning algorithms. So the graphics card tends to be very, very fast, and oftentimes the biggest challenge in creating an efficient large-scale deep learning algorithm is getting data as quickly as possible from the hard drive, the HDD here, off into the graphics card so it can be processed and you can get a result as quickly as possible. And you want to spend as little time as possible interacting with the CPU. The CPU is designed to do many different things. It's very versatile, very flexible, but as a result, it's much slower than the GPU. And the GPU is where you can do deep learning computations a lot faster. But the GPU is far less flexible, and as a result, you need to have specialized algorithms to get data and computation on the GPU frameworks let you do this. So that concludes our very brief introduction to the high level idea of what happens inside these frameworks. And next we'll be talking about the specifics of PyTorch. How do you create computation graphs in PyTorch and how do you do learning and optimization once you have a model? And from that we'll then move on to specific natural language applications using PyTorch.